please follow along as I read 1 Timothy chapter uh, 1, verses 17 through 20. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This command I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you fight the good fight, keeping faith in a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. Among these are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, so that they will be taught not to blaspheme. Have you ever been in a worship service? I assume you have a couple at least. But have you ever been in a worship service or a Sunday school or a Bible study or you're reading scripture and then all of a sudden the Holy Spirit comes over you and you feel you get so excited and full of enthusiasm that you could feel you could even blood burst a blood vessel. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes when I'm working on a message, I just have to get up and walk around the room and come back and sit down and keep on working. Well, I think this is what happened to Paul in verse 17. Up in the first 16 verses, Paul had been describing God's work in terms of his mercy and his grace and his patience. And then all of a sudden, this great doxology just sprung right up from him and he spilled this out with ink on the paper that he was writing on. And so he just stopped what it was that he was writing about and he says, now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever, amen. Let's look at this awesome description of, God, of our great God just for a moment. God is the king eternal. He's the king of the ages. He's the king over time from before creation and on through uh, eternity. He is immortal. He is in the purest sense imperishable and cannot be diminished in any form or fashion. He is invisible. Other than the incarnate Jesus on earth, all we see of him are glimpses of his glory. And he is the only true God. As Isaiah said in chapter 45 and verse 18, I am the Lord and there is none else. And then to this awesome God, Paul invokes honor and glory forever and ever. Now, is this great God, this awesome God, worthy of our worship? Yes, of course he is. Is this great God worthy of us keeping our end of a covenantal agreement? Yes, of course. So let's look at it. In Exodus chapter 20 and verse 8, it says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Exodus chapter 31 and verse 16 tells us to celebrate the Sabbath as a perpetual covenant. Now we've all heard that the commandment about keeping the Sabbath isn't repeated in the New Testament. We can debate whether it was or not, but it doesn't have to be. It doesn't need repeating. Keeping the Sabbath is part of a perpetual covenant between God and his people. Who benefits from this perpetual covenant? God isn't better off because we come to worship. It's us who come, uh, who uh, uh, we gain because of this covenant. Now times were dangerous for Christians back when Paul wrote this epistle to Timothy. And it was uh, dangerous all during the time the New Testament church was developing. So why go to church if it's dangerous and threatening? Why go to church when COVID is active? Why go to church if it's raining 
are your favorite aunt is sick. And some people do stay home because they have an aunt in Illinois who is sick and she might call, so they stay home. What happens when you attend church and keep the Sabbath? Keeping the Sabbath isn't just a suggestion or a good idea. Every time you attend church, you are renewing or keeping your pledge to trust and obey God in all things. When you come here, you have demonstrated your trust in God, regardless of whether it's dangerous or whatever else it is. Not keeping the Sabbath is more than just an act of disobedience. Not keeping the Sabbath is a definite refusal to renew your oath of submission that you made when you became a Christian. Now, some people don't like the term oath of submission. You can substitute promises that you have made to God. At some point in your life, you verbally or mentally submitted to God. And if you haven't submitted to God, there's no better time than to do it than right now. If you haven't listened to Pete's sermon this morning here in person, listen to it remotely. There is always time for us to submit to Christ. No matter what you may say or think about uh, worship and attending church, when you do that, you are keeping your end of the covenant that God made with us. When he makes covenants, he makes promises, and he certainly has expectations. After Paul gave this great inspiring doxology, he returned, as it were, uh, uh, to giving Timothy and us instructions about our life within the church that we attend. So we have this first chapter. He's telling us about our life and how we should live and act within the church. And right partway through that, this great doxology came out, was produced in his mind and put on paper for us. So it's almost like we have a certain amount of instruction this great inspirational thing about God, and then he goes back to the giving us the instructions again. Verse 18 contains a charge for us within the church of Jesus Christ. Speaking to us who are in attendance, he says we must fight the good fight. First, and let's look at the fight he was talking about. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, in verse 14, it says, Do not neglect the spiritual gifts, he's speaking to Timothy, which was, bespoke, which was bestowed upon you through prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands by the presbytery. We are given similar charges when we join the church. So Timothy was given certain charges, prophetic utterances, when he became pastor of the church in Ephesus, and we're given some, we're given charges when we become members of this church. And when we're given those charges and we accept those charges and we agree to them, we really are making a covenant with the church. The church says, we will provide these opportunities for you and you're saying, I am going to take advantage of those opportunities. So a prophecy was given to Timothy to fight the good fight. Scripture abounds with teachings about people, some people who fought the good fight and some of them who fought the bad fight. To fight a good fight, you must finish well. That was hit a little bit on this morning in Sunday school class. A couple of weeks ago, a question was asked in Sunday school, and this is very close to the question that was asked. The question was, when in life do you feel the closest to God? That was a good question. One answer that was given to me afterwards was, 
I feel the closest when I am the, in the deepest pit. And I th I've thought a lot about that question, and I've thought a lot about that answer. When I thought about that, I had to agree that if you feel the closest to God when things are at their worst, in my opinion at least, you're well on your way to finishing the battles of life quite well. It's easy to feel close to Christ when everything is going your way. But when you are at the bottom of the pit and you feel the closest to Christ, then it just seems as though that pit within a certain period of time is going to melt away. What a time to feel closest to God when the world is closing in on you. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7 speaks of a spiritual gift that we certainly all have. We might disagree with the scripture, but we do have it. God, he says, has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Sometimes we might say, I'm too shy to share my faith. That shyness didn't come from God. It comes from your imagination because you don't want to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's a good excuse because a lot of people use it. So you feel very comfortable with it. But if you have come to Christ in full submission, then we have a certain amount of power. We have a certain amount of love. And we have a certain amount of discipline. Verse 19 says we're to fight the good fight by holding on to the objective gift of the faith. When he talks about the faith, he's referring to the apostolic faith, the faith of Jesus Christ. But at the same time that we must objectively uh, hold on to that gift, we must subjectively value and maintain a good conscience. Saying you are holding on to the faith and having a guilty conscience, something is amiss. Something doesn't quite blend together, and it's within you, it's not within Scripture. If we're to fight at all, we must grasp the basic essentials of the faith. How can we love or understand our God if we know very little about him? If you love God knowing a little about him, will you love him less if you learn more about him? Sunday school is a great place to learn more or to relearn something that you have forgotten about God, Christ, the Holy Spirit, and the scriptures. I tell you, the more you know about God, the greater your love will be and the greater your appreciation and understanding will be. Now, obviously, I, I like the preaching and all of this in the services. Obviously, I do. But I am so ready to admit that you can really learn more in Sunday school class because you have interaction going back and forth. You can share your thoughts and your thinking. You hear the same thing from other people. And you have someone kind of leading the class. They can bring these things together. When we're preaching, we don't know if you're with us or not. Some people can sit and look you right in the eye in church and be sound asleep. They must. Now, a logical question. How do we fight well? Verse 9 says we do it simply by keeping faith and a good conscience. Now, that sounds simple, but it's not so simple. Why do we have to fight? The reason we have enemies. The church has always had its enemies and it always will have them. And I'm not referring to outside forces that try to harm the church or governments that try to tax us or anything else. I'm referring to the enemies of the church as those people who will try to get us to dilute our doctrinal beliefs. 
Pete reported a couple of weeks ago on our vote at General Assembly against ordaining uh, same-sex attracted teaching elders, ruling elders, and deacons. Not voting that way would have been a watering down of our theological conviction. In 1994, some leading evangelicals and some Roman Catholics wrote a paper called Evangelicals and Catholics Together. They wanted to build unity between Protestant and Catholics, and building unity sounds good. But that paper watered down the call of the Protestant Reformation of justification by faith alone. I read the entire paper. Not only did it water down the justification by faith alone, the paper concluded by saying that whatever we may agree upon, the supremacy of the papacy would remain dominant. The Protestant church dodged a bomb by rejecting the document. When you looked at the Protestant, leading Protestant evangelicals who signed it, you would almost buy into it without reading the document. A few years ago, Louisiana Presbytery dissolved itself. It doesn't exist now. They were so divided theologically that if a church needed to call a pastor within that presbytery, no one would have gotten the majority of votes to accept the call. Let me tell you some of the issues that had the uh, presbytery totally divided. Some said that small children must take communion. If they're old enough to hold it and put it in their mouth, they were to take communion. Others disagreed with them. They disagreed over using of tongues in worship services. Some to uh, uh, promoted it totally and felt it was necessary. Some endorsed and wrote books on what's called the New Perspective on Paul, and that issue is still running around. But the New Perspective on Paul opposes what we call justification by faith alone. They say there must be works. And there were other issues. There was no hope of them ever coming together where they could agree on issues. So they dissolved the presbytery. Now, each of those people held all these different uh, ideas, felt as though they were being true to Scripture. But you couldn't be. You just couldn't be. I had a professor, Richard Pratt, and I may have told this before, but when he came to RTS to be a professor, he almost didn't pass Presbytery. They had a big debate over his view concerning the use of the Sabbath. Now, this guy has a doctorate from Harvard, okay? He's no dummy. And he made his case. Well, he was passed, but after a lot of, of uh, disputing, and in class, someone said to him, what would you have done if Presbytery had refused to transfer your ordination into this Presbytery? He said, I would have reviewed my thoughts on keeping the Sabbath. And he said, if the majority of your brethren think you are wrong, then you re-examine your position. And I thought that was pretty good because a lot of the people that were disagreeing with him had no theological education whatsoever. And he got his doctorate in uh, 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 Middle East languages, you know, uh, Chaldean and uh, Babylonian and all these other languages. The guy was brilliant, but he would rethink his position. And, and that's what Louisiana Presbyterian, they really had to somehow rethink their positions, but they didn't. They gave up their presbytery instead. We have to be careful not only to guard our own beliefs, but we have to be able to recognize people, especially within our church, who have strayed from biblical beliefs. Most people convince themselves they have faith and they convince themselves they have a good conscience, 
But convincing yourself of it isn't enough. There's nothing like being ratified in your thinking by your congregation, by your church. Our Christian life is as important as our Christian faith. And the defense of sound doctrine is a matter of practice as well as beliefs. We have to live what it is that we say we believe. The two virtues of faith and conscience are linked together in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, verse 19, and again in chapter 3 and verse 9. Those two things, faith and conscience, are linked together. Verse 9 describes what happens to one who waters down their doctrine or does not live out their faith. Those who reject keeping and living the faith suffer shipwreck. Two men are named that shipwreck, shipwreck their lives for blaspheming, and blaspheming isn't even considered, considered serious today. In verse 20, it says, Hymenaeus and Alexander were handed over to Satan so that they could be taught not to blaspheme. Hymenaeus is referred to again in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 17 and 18, where it says, his talk spread like gangrene and he upset the faith of some. Not only were these two men handed over to Satan, but they harmed others while they were on that journey to Satan. Don't ever put yourself in a position where someone who denies a basic doctrine of the faith can harm you. It says they rejected faith. So how does one reject faith? John chapter 6, verse 37 through verse 39, repeats the promise that Jesus does not cast out anyone that the Father has given to him. Now, in our text, it clearly does not say that they rejected their faith. It says they rejected faith. They never had it. They were presented with faith. And they said, no, I reject it. It's not going to become mine. These men, it says, made a shipwreck of the faith. They hit something and they sank like the Titanic. Not only did the Titanic sink, it took many people to their deaths as it went down. When the Titanic sank, did it take everyone with it? No, it didn't. All were harmed, but not all were lost. Some survived the shipwreck. If Hymenaeus and Alexander had true faith, they would have been like the survivors of the Titanic. They'd have been shaken up, but they would have survived to tell about it. Paul was shipwrecked. Second Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 25, he says, three times I was shipwrecked, and a night uh, and a day I spent in the deep. He survived. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 13, Paul says that he was a former blasphemer. So Paul says, I was a blasphemer. We have two men that were handed over to Satan because they were blasphemers. Think of shipwrecks just for a minute. Paul was guilty of blasphemy as they were. Compare what Jesus did with Paul and what he did with Hymenaeus and Alexander. Paul, through faith, was made into an apostle. And the other two who rejected the idea of faith were handed over to Satan. Now, did this put Hymenaeus and Alexander outside of the spirit of the Holy, outside the power of the Holy Spirit. No, they were not, they were handed over, yes, but which is greater, the power of the Holy Spirit 
to work a miracle in the life of a blasphemer or Satan in keeping him. And it says, why were they turned over to, to Satan? It says they were turned over so that they could learn what they did. They could learn not to blaspheme. By learning, they were put in a position where they could understand their sin and making repentance a possibility. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 5, Paul was writing about an immoral person. And, to, and speaking of that person, he said, deliver him to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just think, you can literally be handed over to Satan, but that doesn't mean you've escaped the power of the Holy Spirit. Because that can happen so that you can understand your sin, whatever it may be, or your rebellion, or your rejection of the faith. Now, my friends, if there's hope for blasphemers like Paul, Hymenaeus, and Alexander, and the immoral one in the, in the church in Corinth, is there hope for us and for our family and friends who are either outside of the church or skating on thin ice? Normally when I say sk skating on thin ice, I'm talking about people within the church. And they're just making, just staying above water. Won't take much to make them think. In four short verses, we have gone from having a mountaintop experience, ex uh, experiencing spontaneous praise for God to dealing with shipwrecked lives. In closing, I would like to have you pray to God that your continuous praising of him will be so great and consistent that you will be delivered from major shipwrecks. I said major ship shipwrecks. Pray that your shipwrecks will be more like tipping over in a canoe than sinking in the deep, dark, cold waters of the North Atlantic. I don't know what it's worth, but I've tipped over in a canoe in ice water. I'm somewhere in between. But seriously, seriously, if you think of Paul giving this instruction, teaching, preaching, if you want to say that, and all of a sudden he broke up in this great doxology. It woke us all up as to who it is that we're serving. And then he goes back to giving us more instruction. Yes, yeah, shipwrecks come and shipwrecks go, some are greater than others. But if we could have this mind of Paul, where every so often our praise just rises up and takes over everything else in our lives. You're well on your way. Let us pray. Father, certainly we're all going to have shipwrecks in our lives. Some will be greater than others. Some will be just a small tripping of the tongue. But Father, if we can feel closest to you when we're in the deepest depths, what a comfort that is. What a comfort it is to be able to know in your own mind that even though you were pushed and tested and tried and stomped on, thrown in the water, yet you were close to Jesus. Father, be with us now as we continue partaking of the Lord's Supper. We pray this in Jesus' name.